So for our last topic, you can run something like our recorded query project hours against your database like this. And then you can process that by piping the output, which is text, into something that gets rid of that ID line and then piping that into something like WC to get the number of records or whatever your processing is and that works just fine. It's very common to see a processing pipeline that starts with a bit of SQL to get data out of that GIS database, out of that genomics database, out of that climate database to get the raw data that you then pipe through your other commands. But you will more often be accessing the database from within a program that's written in Perl or MATLAB or R or Python. And we'll show you how to do it in Python because almost every language does it pretty much the same way. They all imitate a single programming interface, an API, that was invented back in the 1980s. They use the same terminology and the same concepts. So what I'm about to show you in Python translates over pretty easily into other languages. So let's have a look at a program written in Python. I'm going to point at the lines. The very first thing this program does is load the library. I'm getting version 3 of the SQLite library. I'm getting its DB API, Database Application Programming Interface version 2. And inside my program, I'm going to call that SQLite. This line is magic. Every different language will require you to get the database access library in a different way. Java, C++, C Sharp, Visual Basic, Perl, whatever, they will all have some line that says, here's how to go and get the library that knows how to talk to this particular database manager. Because every database manager needs a different interface library. You'll import something different for Postgres than you do for SQLite 3. You'll import something different again for Oracle. So that's one line that's different based on what kind of database system you're talking to. The good news is all of these different libraries try very hard to provide the same interface, the same set of function calls, so that you can access everything the same way once you've imported the library. There's only two things that change in your program based on what kind of database manager you're using and what database you're connecting to. Everything else in your program can stay the same, at least in theory. Here's the second line of the program. I go to the library, SQLite, and I say, I want a connection to, and then I give it something that identifies the actual database that I'm connecting to. Remember, the library knows how to talk to a database manager, which is a piece of software, but I still have to identify which database I'm getting my data from. In the case of SQLite, I just give it the name of a file, because SQLite stores all of the database in a single file. In the case of the other four systems, Oracle, DB2, MySQL, and Postgres, this will probably look like a URL, and I will probably have to provide a username and a password. I might have to say, for example, um, climatedata.worldbank.org, then give my username and then give my institutional password so that it knows who's connecting and it can check the privileges. That changes based on the database. It depends on how that was set up. Many databases allow you to connect without giving a username or password. Some require you to give a username so they can keep track of who's getting what, but you don't need a password. Others don't require anything at all. So I go and I get a connection. That's like making the phone call, right? The next step is the one that sometimes seems like magic. I have to ask the connection to give me a cursor. Now, a cursor in a text editor is that little blinky thing that shows you where you're currently editing. A cursor in a program that's talking to a database is the thing that keeps track of a particular query. Because if you think of large sites like NCBI or Amazon, they can be handling thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of queries at the same time. Many, many people can be pulling data out of that database at once. So we need to keep track not only of who's connected, but of what queries they're running, because a single user might have several queries going on at once. If it takes 10 or 15 seconds to satisfy a query, or 10 minutes, 
in the case of a large query, you might decide to start one query and then run another one over that same connection. And the best analogy is the connection is like the phone number, the cursor is like the extension. If you call the university, there's a phone number for the switchboard, but then you get extension 1234 to connect to a particular office. That's the same idea as connection and cursor. Okay, now I've got a cursor, and the cursor is the thing I'm going to use from here on in. I say, cursor, please send this SQL to the database for execution. This is just what we've been typing in directly to the SQL prompt, including the semicolon at the end. Please don't forget it. This is any query that I could run interactively from the prompt. I just say, cursor, I want the database to execute that and give me back the results. Okay, so that string gets sent off, and then I can say, cursor, please fetch the results. Now, typically, you can do a fetch all to say, get them all in one batch, or you can do a fetch and give it a number and say, I want the next 20. If you know in advance that you're only going to get a few answers, where a few means a few hundred or a few thousand, just do a fetch all. Just get everything at once. But if you don't know how much data you're going to get, or if you're expecting a lot of data, gigabytes these days, what you'll probably do is say, fetch me the next hundred or the next twenty or the next thousand. I'll process those and then I'll come around and fetch the next twenty or hundred or thousand, process those and so on. I'll batch up my processing. And you've all seen this. If you go to a site like Amazon and say, recommend some books, they'll show you twenty and then there's a more button. What's happened is their program has gone, done a fetch from the database and said, fetch twenty results. They show you those 20, and when you click more, they go and they page through and they fetch the next 20. That way, they're only grabbing a little bit of data at a time, and they're not fetching a lot of data just to throw it away. In this case, I know my database is small, so I just do a fetch all. And then I say, for R in results, for each row in my results, print out the fields. I get back a list of results. Each element in that list is a list whose fields are the record fields. I asked for two things, first name and last name. So each element of my results will be a list with two fields. R0 will be a first name, R1 will be a last name. If I had asked for four things here, every element in results would be a list with four values, and so forth. I get one element in results for each result to my query. So here, I know I've got four people in the person table. I should get four things. When I'm done all of my processing, I close the cursor and then close the connection. Now, you, strictly speaking, you don't have to do this. Your program could just quit. It's very good practice to close things on your way out because if you've connected over the network to a database in Australia, or if you're in Australia, New Zealand, if your program just stops and goes away, it may or may not, on its way out, send a signal to the database saying, I'm gone, you can free up the connection for somebody else to use. If it does not send a signal, the database manager will probably hold that connection open for one minute, five minutes, or ten minutes, depending on settings. During that time, nobody else can use the connection. There's only a finite number of connections, typically a few thousand, to a machine hosting a database. So if you've got lots of people whose programs aren't being polite, are just putting down the phone but not hanging up, the line isn't freed, and if the line isn't freed, if the connection isn't closed, it can't be reused, so access becomes more difficult for other people. They have to wait longer to get a connection. So, close the cursor, close the connection. Anything that you open, you should close. So let's see this program in action. Python, run allnames.py. And there's my four people. Just to go through it again, I got my database library. This is the thing that knows how to connect to and communicate with a particular database management system. That's one of the things that changes <coughs> if I ever decide to switch from SQLite to MySQL to DB2. I get a connection, and the parameter I pass in is the name of the database, the URL for the database, a username and password, something that the sysadmin requires in order to let me get at this data. In the case of SQLite 3, it's just a file name. I then say, right, now that I've got a connection, let me get a cursor. The connection is like the phone number. 
the cursor is like the extension that actually connects me to a particular person. I then ask the cursor to send this string of SQL down to the database for execution. I then go back and ask the cursor, get me all the results for your query. If I want to overlap several queries for performance reasons, I would need a separate cursor for each. If I want to talk to three different people at once, they better be on different extensions, otherwise the phone call is going to get pretty messy. I can either fetch all of the results or fetch them in batches. In this case, I'm fetching all. I'm going to get back a list of results, one for each result record, and each element of results will be a sublist that's got as many fields as I asked for. So here I'm just printing them out, and when I'm done, I close the cursor and close the connection to free up resources for other people to use. This is at the heart of most websites that you access. Your web browser sends material to a program which pulls out things like what papers are you searching for, what date range, what journals, and so forth, formulates the SQL, sends that to the database that's actually storing the information, fetches the results, and instead of printing them directly, puts HTML tags around it so it'll display nicely in a web page, and gives your browser back that web page. Right. You don't need to have all of that web goo on the way in or the way out. You can just run a program like this on your machine and connect to databases that can be anywhere in the world as long as the sysadmin has allowed access. Having said that, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with this if you're not careful. And we discuss some of them in the online material. But this is the basic model. So to close, why use two programming languages? Why have both Python and SQL? The answer is SQL is not a complete programming language. It can do a lot, particularly if you use non-standard vendor-specific extensions, but it was never intended to be a complete application programming language. Its job is to pull data out of databases and put data back in. It's a restricted model of computing. The restrictions allow us to make it go very fast. By narrowing the scope, we can optimize the performance. The things that it does, it does very well. Faster than you could do if you were working with plain text files and writing the code yourself. Partly, that's because of the restricted model. If I only do three things, I can do them all well. Partly, it's because of those tens of thousands of engineer hours, engineer years rather, that have been invested in this. Every big commercial enterprise, every big government department sits on top of databases. Billions and billions and billions of dollars have been spent making those databases go fast, making them reliable, making them secure. Because billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars depend on that. There's no way you can beat those tens of thousands of engineer years of effort. Don't even try. SQL doesn't do everything, so we need general programming languages like, like Python, like Java, like C Sharp, to do everything else, to format up our HTML, to do our graphs, to create image files, and so forth. Nobody would write a finite elements package in SQL, but SQL is certainly a good way to store the models and the metadata about the models. Going forward, as I said at the outset, I expect that we will start to see non-SQL databases become more popular in some areas. And three years from now, I expect at least one of them will have become popular enough that we can rely on it still being there five years down the road, ten years down the road, and it's worth investing effort in it. It's worth putting applications on it. It's worth teaching it. Right now, it's not clear which, if any, are going to win out. This is going to be around for a long, long time. And this one is worth learning. Thank you.